page 391, you will find Job chapter 42, the last chapter of Job. Three ninety one in that black Bible. And then when when uh, Randy's done with his two part two sermon series and then Daniel done preaching two times, we're going to start the Gospel of Luke. That'll be July fourteenth. We'll start the Gospel of Luke to get back into the New Testament. <coughs> Job chapter forty two. I'm going to read and then we'll begin our study. <clears throat> then Job answered Yahweh, or the Lord, and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak, I will ask you, and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. And it came about after Yahweh had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore take for yourself seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves and my servant Job will pray for you. For I will accept him so that I may not do with you according to your folly because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite went and did as the Lord told them, and Yahweh accepted Job. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. Then all his brothers and all his sisters and all who had known him before came to him. And they ate bread with him in his house. And they consoled him and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought on him. Each one gave him one piece of money and each a ring of gold. And Yahweh blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 female donkeys. And he had seven sons and three daughters. And he named the first Jemima and the second Keziah and the third Karen Hapuk. And in all the land no women were found so fair as Job's daughter. Their father gave them inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his grandsons four generations. And Job died an old man full of days. Frank Lloyd Wright, one of the most innovative artists of the U.S., he built the second Imperial Hotel in Japan. It was built from 1950 to 1923. And it famously survived the great Kanto earthquake of 1923. Journalists had predicted the hotel was totally destroyed, but Wright was absolutely confident that it was undamaged. Ah, let's not be so hasty, though, to put our trust, our confidence in this building, because it was affected by the earthquake, although it was one of the very few buildings that was still standing was affected by the earthquake and had to be demolished decades later due to its mud sinking. Too bad. What a bummer. When it comes to houses, money, people, relationships, job, family, retirements, the government, our confidence can weigh very thin. Couple that with disasters. Crime, poor health, tragedies, unexpected events makes things worse. As we come to this last chapter in Job, as we finish up the book of Job, we see that bad things happen. 
Bad things happen in this life. Bad things happen to God's people. And yet, our confidence doesn't lie in our circumstances. Our confidence lies in God. So we trust our sovereign God within our painful, unknown suffering, confident in Him and His love and His desire to bless us. We trust Him and we're confident in Him. And we're confident of His love. And we're confident that He has a desire. He wants to bless us. He wants to bless His people. Job was now satisfied. He had a new appreciation of the scope and harmony of God's world, said one writer, of which he was a small part. God's world is beautiful and dangerous. Yet he's everywhere, showing himself to be powerful and wise, and yet also mysterious and puzzling. Puzzling as this microphone. Ever since Randy Hafner used it, he ruined this. me. <laughs> but I must have confidence in God and this, uh, this microphone bothering me right now. That's right. Job sees very clearly God does what he wants to do. He answers to no one. God is obligated to no one. And God owns everything. And he knows God in a much deeper, meaningful way. Look, God always uses bad things for his good and our good. He turns the bad into his good. He can do that. And what's even better for Job is that Yahweh spoke to him. I mean, that was awesome in and of itself. So Job was, was, was humbling in effect, but it was also such great delight. He took such great delight that God was there speaking to him. So he says, my eyes see you. So because God takes these bad things in our lives and he turns them into his good and our good, Christian, then wait for God. He will bring us out of the troubles of this life eventually. Maybe not to your death, but he will be faithful and true merciful, gracious, and loving towards you. We may experience pain and suffering for a time, but we must trust that God always plans good things for his people. God always plans good things for his people. He does. In this life, we'll have tribulation, suffering, Trials, sickness, eventually death stings us. But where is the sting of death? Where is its sting? Though we pass away, though we die, we, as followers of Jesus who trust in him, living a life of obedience, we, as followers of Jesus who trust in him, living a life of obedience, we will face eternal glory with our King. In other words, all the suffering in this world, it will end one day. All the suffering in this world, it will end one day. God God delights to shower his people with his blessings. He loves to give blessings to those who, who faithfully serve and fear him. He loves to show that he's a gracious, a compassionate, and loving God. He loves to show this. It's the greatest way he shows his glory. You'll, you'll find out when Randy preaches on Exodus 33 and 34, when Moses says, show me your glory, God begins by saying, Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord, what? The compassionate and gracious God. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God loves to show that about himself. 
That's the ultimate display of His glory. And what a great display of His glory. How does God display His glory today on this world with a bunch of sinners being together? That's how. Because He shows He's a gracious God. And He saved sinners. Do you believe this? Do you believe God plans good things for you? Do you believe that God delights to shower you with his blessings? It's hard to see that now. It's hard to see, but don't despair. God is good. God is good all the time. God takes evil and turns it into good. Just like Joseph. Joseph, all this evil took place upon Joseph. He suffered, was, was through all these tribulations and trials and turmoil, but God changed that. And that's why he says in Genesis 50, 20, what you meant for evil, God means for good. And then what's the, what is the worst upon the worst, the ultimate evil that's ever happened in this world? <coughs> the death of the Son of God. The crucifixion of his eternal son. The worst evil that could happen. And yet, God took the worst evil and he turned it upside down. He took the worst evil and he turned it into the ultimate good. If you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, you are a sinner and God can take you and turn it into the ultimate good, you can have salvation. You can have freedom. You can have Christ. That's the ultimate good you can turn it into. Salvation of sinners for his glory. We can have confidence in God. Confidence in his love for us. Confidence in his desire to bless us. Let's begin in our text. Notice the first point we bring up here is our confidence must, must be in God. Our confidence must be in God. Verses 1 through 6. Job answered, He said, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. This is the message that Job received from the Lord. All that counts is God's purpose. And he's able to bring it to pass. And this assured Job, as well as the Lord's love for Job, it assured him. So he's saying, you can do everything. None of your plans can be frustrated. In other words, I have limited knowledge of what you're doing. And your detailed plans cannot be foiled. Your detailed plans cannot be thwarted. All that happens in this world and your life is according to God's wise friend. All that happens. And it's so hard to see. Especially when, when you're in the middle of a difficult time. Today, right now. You're in the middle of a difficult time. That's hard to see that, isn't it? It's hard to see when you look at God. You're really in control of this government. When you see all these scandals. It's hard to see. But maybe God is doing this on purpose. Maybe God's bringing out this evil in our government on purpose, bringing these things out according to his wise purposes. All that happens in this world, all that happens in our lives is according to God's wise framework. Our confidence must be in this, must be in God. Notice in verse 3. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I declare that which I did not understand things too wonderful. Which I do not know. Verse 4. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you instruct me. He, he's quoting from Yahweh. He's quoting from the Lord in these two verses. And he's agreeing with the Lord. When he quotes in, in, in uh, chapter 30, verse 2 and 3, and chapter 40, verse 7, he's quoting from the Lord. And he's admitting there was much he did not understand about God. Yeah, you think? 
Job sees that God has a right to do things when he wants, as he wants. God's wisdom is simply beyond our ability to grasp. So he's saying his suffering makes sense to God. But God gave him no explanation. No reasons. Nothing. Look, there are some things, just some things in this life that are beyond our ability to process. That are beyond our ability to comprehend. And you know what? That's okay. Because we're only human. That's why Job says, things too wonderful for me. T -t too wonderful for Job. But they're good things. I mean, is it a bad thing to be human? Is it a bad thing that we're a creature? Is it a bad thing that we're small? No, it's a good thing. Because it puts things in the right perspective. Our lives makes sense to God, though it might not make sense to us. So what has happened in the past year, years, that doesn't make sense to you? Do you trust it makes sense to God? Do you have confidence in God? He knows what he's doing. Life is filled with new and challenging events. Do you have confidence though in your Father? Do you have confidence in him and what he's doing? We should. We must. Think about it. Uh, God chose your father and mother. Who's going to be your father? Who's going to be your mother? God chose your place of birth. Where are you going to be born? Arizona? Mexico? South America? God decided you'd be a male. God decided you'd be a female. You have physical size, your health, your looks, your strengths, your weaknesses, the color of eyes you would have, your hair, or lack thereof. <laughs> God decided to do that. God chose those things to happen. And, and to show you grace in Jesus. Our lives make sense to God, though it might not make very much sense to us. Notice in verse 5. And into verse 6, Job says, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. His, his deepest longing had been fulfilled. He heard from God himself, but, but, but he sees him. I, I still love you, Job. I'm not against you, Job. His deepest longings have been fulfilled. That God would listen to him. That God would speak. Job, I'm not against you. And when you take it, this whole section, verses 1 through 5, and then also verses 7 through 17, and then we, we zero in on verse 6. <clears throat> verse 6 seems to make a little bit more sense, especially when we look at how these words should be defined. Like, for instance, take, therefore, I retract in verse 6. I think the ESV says, I despise myself. Myself is not the Hebrew. Uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible says, um, I, I take back my words. Another translation is, could be, I melt. Although this form is not seen in the Hebrew. But another translation, which the translation I think would be better, is this, I am lightly esteemed. Therefore, I am lightly esteemed. The same concept, the word's not used in chapter 40, verse 4, but the same concept is used in chapter 40 when he says, I am insignificant there in verse 4. Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? Job is saying the same thing. Contextually, this makes better sense. 
Words are always driven by their context. So when we take it this way from the context, I am lightly esteemed. Job is saying, he's repeating how insignificant he saw himself before the Lord. And then look at the next part of verse 6. I repent in dust and ashes. Now, repent can mean sorry or repent, but it can also mean to console or to comfort oneself. As a matter of fact, if you go in the same chapter, chapter 42, verse 11, that same word is used there when it says, and they consoled him and comforted him. That's the same word that's used here in verse 6. They comforted him. Contextually, this makes better sense. So in other words, it will be translated better like this. Therefore, I am lightly esteemed I comfort myself in dust and ashes. Since Job was reassured of God's love for him, he acknowledged once again his insignificance and that he takes comfort in the fact that God is not against him. He loves him and he's greater than him and Job loved it. He took comfort in that. Comfort in the dust and in the ashes, in the midst of his suffering, in the midst of his turmoil and trials, he says, I'm comforted. I'm consoled. What was most important to Job? What was most important to Job was that he met God face to face, or to put it another way. What really crushed Job? What crushed Job is that it seemed like God silent. It seemed like God didn't care. It seemed like God was apathetic. It seemed like God didn't love him. But he says, but now my eye sees you. I see you now. I'm, I'm comforted now. I know I'm in significance. I know that I'm in your sight. You're so much greater than I could ever imagine. I can take such comfort his confidence was in God himself. We should have our confidence in God himself. And point number two, God's confidence will be in us. That throws you off, doesn't it? How, how is God confident in us? Is that true? Oh, absolutely it's true. You see that verses seven through eight. Came about after the Lord spoke these words to Job. The Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, I'm angry with you against your two friends because you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. Therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls, seven rams. Go to my servant Job, offer burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job, pray for you, for I will accept them, said, I will not do according to your folly because you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job. Four times, my servant Job, my servant Job, my servant Job, my servant Job. Hmm. You think he's trying to emphasize something? Nah. <laughs> this solidifies our view about Job. Job is going to be vindicated and received it not exactly the way he expected it. But God was faithful to his servant. He has confidence in those who love him. He has confidence in those who fear him. He has confidence in his people and his servants. You see that in Job? My servant, Job. God. God was the one who trusted Job. To hold on to God within Job's painful, unknown suffering. He stands as an example to us all. Job is the greatest believer in the Old Testament. The greatest. Puts us to shame. Because when little things come up in our lives, we get bent out of shape, don't we? Do we simply blow up when things don't go our way? Do we simply give up when life does unexpected things? Is that how we respond? Where's our confidence in God? And how can God have confidence in us? But we would trust Him. Do we trust our God in the big and small things? In 
not only does the Lord say my servant Job four times, but two times in these two verses, the Lord says that Job spoke of God what is right. God never rebuked Job in his two speeches. Never. He never rebuked Job in his two speeches. From chapter 38 to chapter 41, not one word of rebuke to Job. See, this is where commentators get all handsome. Because they don't know what to do with this. Because, well, it, it, it says Job repented and he sinned, but then yet God doesn't rebuke him. Yeah, he doesn't rebuke him. So it means that word can't mean repent, friends. Because Job didn't sin. Remember, Job's three friends took the view that if someone is suffering, then that person is in the wicked group. If someone is prospering, then that person is in the righteous group. But they spoke wrongly, not Job. Job never spoke wrongly. They were trying to defend God. Oh yeah, because God needs someone to defend him, right? Look, sometimes look at people prosper. Sometimes righteous people suffer. But it doesn't mean that God lacks justice. It doesn't mean that God lacks righteousness. He is still God. And so his friends were telling him, oh, you got to repent, Job. You did something wrong. And they were tempting Job to repent. And if Job were to admit some sin so he can get back all the stuff, then Satan would have won. It would have proved Satan right. In my mind, how the roles have reversed now. They are the objects of God's wrath. My wrath is kindled against you. They are need of grace. Well, wait a second, I thought Job, no. They were the ones who were wrong. Unless they go to Job, the one they said needed, oh, Job, you need our counsel. That's, that's right, we're we're a God's gift to you, Job. Boy, how, how things have changed now, haven't they? Unless they go to Job as a mediator, they will not escape his divine wrath. And notice this is directed to Eliphaz because he's kind of the leader amongst the three. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that Job was sinless. I'm not saying that. Nor did Job say that. Job said in chapter 31, I admit my sin. I don't, I don't cover, I don't hide it like Adam did. He admits his sin. He did not hide his sin. He confessed it before God because he feared being ostracized from the, from the community. But in this book, in his book, some assume that he questioned God's justice. Some assume that Job became self-righteous with prideful and arrogance. Maybe so. But if he did, why didn't God rebuke him? Why did he rebuke his three friends? See? You know, instead, Job remained steadfast in his faith. Though he virtually demanded God to answer his why question, he did. So if you believe Job did sin, then the weight of these verses lies upon you. But all that to say, no matter which view you take of Job sin or Job did not sin, whichever view you take on that, I'll leave that for you to decide. But what we do find here is, it's the friends who needed intercession, not Job. So the Lord ordered them to go to Job with sacrificial animals to make atonement for their sins. These ones who felt superior to Job now stand in need of forgiveness. Interesting. Job was superior to them. It's amazing that you see how much high, how such high regard that God had for Job here. So much so that he goes to the friends, he said, you guys blew it, go to Job, he'll pray for you, and I'll listen to him, not to you clowns. It's amazing that God has such high regard for Job that he would be the one to intercede for his friends. And Yahweh would favorably receive any request from Job. It's amazing. Not from them. Our confidence 
Let's be in God, and God's confidence will be in us as we continue to trust Him. Third, number three, God loves to bless undeserving sinners. Look at verse 9. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad, Shuhite, Zophar, and Anathite went to do as the Lord told him, and the Lord accepted Job. God accepted Job's intercession on behalf of his friends. He acted as a mediator. Stood in the gap for his friends. Showing them grace. In spite of their harsh words, in spite of the harsh, the insulting words that they said to Job, it's amazing that Job still loved them by praying for And it's even more amazing that God will be so generous to them. You see, this is why Job typifies Jesus. Job points us to the Son of God. He points us to the New Testament. Let me show you how. Job was Yahweh's servant. So was Jesus. Job was well-pleasing in Yahweh's sight. So was Jesus. This is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. Job trusted in Yahweh, so did Jesus. Job suffered tremendously, though he was righteous, so did Jesus. And Job found comfort in the fact that the Lord loved him, so did Jesus. When he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet later he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirits. And both were vindicated. Job was vindicated here in chapter 42, and the Lord Jesus was vindicated because the Father resurrected him from the dead. Job points us. He's, he wants to thrust us to the New Testament. This is Messiah. This is what going to be like. And Job's restored favor, it possessed vicarious benefits for others. Jesus died vicariously for all those who repent from sin and turn to him in repentant faith. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, come to Christ. Come to the Lord Jesus. He was a substitute for sinners. He suffered for sinners. So you and I have to face God's wrath. As Job was the mediator for his friends, was standing in the gap between the Lord and his friends, he's there. That's Jesus. He's the mediator. Who is the mediator between God and man? The man, Christ Jesus. Come to Christ this morning. And you'll find forgiveness of your sins. You are a sinner. You deserve God's punishment, which is true and perfectly just. But you can have blessings. You can have joy. You can have what you were made to have. You were made to have God. God in Jesus Christ. God loves to bless undeserving sinners. Last one, number four. God loves to bless those who trust Him. God loves to bless sinners. And then he wants to bless those who trust him. 10 through 17 comes into play. Verse 10 is kind of like a thesis. A thesis statement. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord increased all that Job had to fall. And 11 through 17 explains. Now mind you, God restoring and blessing Job was not based upon his righteousness. No, it wasn't. It wasn't based upon him speaking right about God. No, it wasn't. It's purely based upon God's love, His grace, His compassion for Job, who suffered the loss of everything for God's sake. Not because God blessed him, but because of who God was. God loves to bless those who trust Him. Here's the truth that we need to understand. 
Sin brings suffering. Righteousness brings blessing. Yet it's not always the case. And God is sovereign and does what he pleases, when he pleases, how he pleases, as he pleases, and with whom he pleases. And yet, God loves to bless his people, not curse them. God is not some sadistic, sick God. Oh, I like dangles you. He doesn't like to do that. Dangling you from the flames of fire. He's not like that. That's what some people think about God. That's why he restored Job. That's why he blessed him. Before we go into this, today for us in Christ, what blessings do we have now? You should go to Ephesians chapter 1 and read them, right? Blessed be the God, Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. Is blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So here's, here's a few of them I put up there for you. Peace with God. Forgiveness of sins. The power to battle and conquer sin. That's a good thing. Continual flow of God's love. In the midst of pain. God's very presence with us. And the ultimate display of his, presence, of his presence is in the local church. That's what John says in 1 John chapter 4. And when we love, when we love each other, we are showing who God is. We're showing we're disciples of Christ. I mean, those are great blessings we have now. The text, back to our text, describes what happened to Job and all his brothers and sisters. But no one before came, he ate bread with him in his house. They consoled him and comforted him. Remember, that's the same one that's used in verse 6. For all the evil that the Lord had brought on him. We're going to look at that in a second. He should give him a piece of money, a gold ring. So Job's relatives, they come to comfort him, give him gifts of gold. Then when they came to eat with Job and reestablish their fellowship with him, they're affirming their, their willingness to share his sorrow. And the ring of gold is a, is a sign of esteem. They esteemed him. Now, we're probably wondering, okay, so why now? Why did they come, why did they come earlier, right? Better late than never, you know, that's what I'm thinking. Right? But this is kind of good. Let's just pull something out of this. Here's a way that God allows others to participate in restoring someone. Giving to someone, providing for them. One way we can participate in each other's lives is monetarily or giving our time. We see that here in the book of Job. And when we as a church, we do this, we stand out to the world. By this, all men will know that we're Christ's disciples when we love one another. When we're giving of our time. We're giving to each other monetarily. We're called to be different, and that is different from the world. They don't act like that. So the sharing is sorrow. Sharing his suffering, you're giving these things to him. But then you see this in verse 11. They come to him for all the evil that the Lord brought on him. Different ways to translate this word it could be misery, adversity. I think the Holman Christian Standard Bible has adversity. It could also mean distress. So, what's going on here? God brings these events into our lives to grow us, to show us our sin, to bring us to the place where we love or trust Him more, to humiliate the evil one, to show that He alone should be worshipped, so that we can identify with Christ as, as He suffered so we would suffer, and or to give us an opportunity to minister to others. Those are the I mean, we can, we can have such great, solid, sure, certain confidence that our God is the only one who can take these evil things, these adversities, these distresses, and he turns them into good. And the greatest good is that we love and worship the Son of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the greatest good. Continue in honor. Text, verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job. 14,000 sheep, 6,000 cattle, 1,000 oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. 
seven sons, three daughters. The names of Jemima, Keziah, Karen Kapuk. So twofold increase of Job's possessions. God shows great goodness to Job by increasing the possessions double time. Not necessarily, again, they're not rewards for his virtue during his time of suffering, but it's God's grace to freely and willingly give to Job. Freely and willingly to bless him. He loves to bless those who trust him. The daughters are named, and then they show their beauty. Again, a note of God's further grace to Job. Uh, Jemima, it means turtle dove, graceful birds or plants, or precious stones. Keziah means aromatic plants, but it was a variety of cinnamon. Karen uh, it means horn of eye paint, or um, highlighting the eyes. The word was actually used uh, of women who had put on makeup, of cosmetics. So imagine that women, uh, you're named cosmetics because you don't need it. That's what she was named. And they were, notice, they were granted an inheritance. In verse 15, and all the land of women were found, so far as Joe's daughters and their father gave them inheritance among their brothers. This is odd. Because only the sons had inheritance. So either Job had plenty of bling bling to be able to go around, or he, he had such generosity towards his daughters. He just spilled out towards his daughters and his sons. And 16. He lived 140 years, saw his sons, grandsons, four generations. He died an old man full of days. He was given a long life, which was God's blessing and proof of his righteousness. Totally fulfilled life. Be with his children, his grandchildren, great grandchildren. Tradition holds he was about 70 years old when this whole ordeal began. And so they think that he lived at least 200 years, some up to 240 some years. It's just all speculation. But why did he have to prosper? Why, why does it end here with him prospering? Some think it's almost anticlimactic. Why, why this? Because fearing God does lead to an abundant life. Think about it. If trusting God only leads to hardship and suffering, then our trust in him would be sadistic. Yet, we must be ready to suffer because the cost of trusting Jesus is our very lives. But it's worth it. It's definitely worth it. I said this earlier. God is not some capricious despot who delights in afflicting his people. He's not like that. He's blameless in his character, doing whatever he pleases. The righteous suffer because God chooses them to suffer for his purpose and for his glory. And you might never know the reasons why. Let us decide to trust our sovereign God for no ulterior motives, but solely because Yahweh is the one true God, the God of the Bible. There's no one like him. There is no other. God loves to bless his people. God is not some fickle tyrant who takes pleasure in making us or watching us suffer. No. He loves to show his grace. So be confident in him. Be confident in his love. Be confident in his desire to bless those who love him for those who trust him within their painful, unknown suffering. much for us to take a few moments to think about. So I have a few moments of silence so you can ponder and think what God has said to us from his word here in Job 42. And then we'll continue our time of worship together, our time of giving. And then we'll sing a couple of songs. It's kind of two songs that will sum up everything we've talked about in the book of Job.